Ladies and gentlemen, I thank Ashri for inviting me to share our preliminary studies and some thought about how ventilation have played a role in the SARS-CoV-2 transmission so far. My name is Yugu Li. I'm now currently in my office in Hong Kong. Um, some more than 10 years ago, I served in the ASHRAE Position Documents Committee on Airborne Infectious Diseases. And the document wrote that engineers play a key role in reducing disease transmission in buildings. But somehow, the title of the position documents has recently been changed, a change that might not carry the same original message any longer, as you can see from bottom right. Now it's called position paper on infectious aerosols. So I thank my team's members and collaborators for their hard work and wisdom and funding agencies for their support over the last some years. First, there is a inconsistency or ambiguity about COVID-19 transmission. And for influenza, the same inconsistency has been there for at least 100 years. For airborne transmission, no authorities admitted the admission, uh, admitted airborne transmission yet. And, but all national, international authorities recommended maintaining good ventilation. This is interesting. If not airborne, why ventilate? ventilate? So one common wisdom is that the airborne diseases are fearful. Do not easily make such claims. Otherwise, people panic. Is this true or should we be panic if a disease can be airborne? I will try to give an explanation today. Probably with this fearful mentality towards the airborne infection and the lack of direct evidences, we had up and downs in our studies of airborne infection. We had a naive miasma theory in the late 17th, 18th centuries. Chapin developed the close contact theory in the early 20th century. Wells developed the droplet nuclear theory in the 1930s. And we had 2003 SARS epidem epidemics. And currently, in the COVID-19 pandemic, social distancing becomes a rule. So today, we understand the major transmission route of respiratory infection, which we may divide into close contact and distant airborne. In close contact, we have three possible media, the large droplets, the airflow, which is called short range airborne, and the surfaces, I call it immediate surfaces. In the long distance, you can have airborne and fomite. The threshold distance is controlled by expired airflows. And I would take it 1.5, and there are different theories about that. So we defined the concept of short range airborne transmission some years ago, and you may understand by looking at a ideal jet and you can calculate the concentration of CO2 as you move from a mouth and to a distance. You can find uh, this concentration profile decays very, very fast. And this is corresponding to the bad uh, breath smell. The closer you are with others and the greater the smell. As you move a distance from it, no smell. So the body odor, odor becomes a tracer for infectious virus. I'd like to uh, let you have a look at the wise riley equation, which is very well known in our community. It simply says ventilation reduces long-range airborne. In the denominator, we have the 
room ventilation rate, which is a building parameter. And in the numerator, we have everything related to individuals, number of infectors, quantity produced by them, and their expiratory flow rate, and also their duration of exposure. Those are, to some degree, all personal data. I started work in this area following the 2003 epidemics. We show then how airborne transmission in this high-rise building block infected more than 300 people. And this can be explained by a rising plume from block E by the wind to other buildings. For that particular building block E, and with two uh, flats, which is number seven and eight, you can see from middle figure, and then for the seven and eight, you have the wind coming from uh, the left on the right front figure, then you can find although index patient was on the flat seven, however, the majority of the infections occurred in flats eight. And this was an old story in 2003. Unfortunately, in the last 10 years, I found it becomes gradually hard to re attract research fundings in the area. So I spent some time even in urban climate research. But who would predict the same story comes back again? Karl Marx said, when I was young, I studied Karl Marx theory. History repeats itself, the first time as tragedy, the second time as farce. So let us look at this equation again. And as mentioned, you have the person, uh, personal data in the numerator and the build data in the denominator. So they are very important. Ventilation rate is important. But how many airborne infection look like outbreaks in which the ventilation rate was measured? Actually, it's not many. And probably Raleigh and his authors in 1978, 78, when they published this equation, they measured the ventilation rate. I do not find many others. So second question, how many outbreaks that we have access to the detailed human behavior data for the numerator? A lot of missing data sets. Actually, very often we don't get it. Lack of such data due to privacy concerns has probably hindered meaningful studies of most outbreaks. By doing this, you and I do not have evidence for the airborne transmission. And this is an interesting phenomenon that I like to take a notice. Now we go to engineering. Consider a room with N people all infected, which means each is an infector, ideal situation. I consider everything is fully mixed with the governing equation. You and I can quickly find out at steady state when the expiratory flow rate of the individual per, per person, individual expiratory or infra, uh, 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 inspiratory flow rate equal to the ventilation rate, then the concentration of whatever treasure you use, in this case, the quanta concentration, in the room will equal to that at the mouth. I consider this flow rate, your expiratory flow rate, see at the normal work is about 0.5 liter per second as a reference flow rate, which we can consider compare to the ventilation rate I'm going to do now. So in case you have you I speak too fast, you can write in the questions and answers section. So let us consider four ventilation situations. One is when this ventilation flow rate Q is greater than the inspiratory or expiratory flow rate, 0.5 liter per second, very, very large, thousands, hundreds of times. And then you have outdoor air. 
uh, error, you can retrieve that when you open la uh, windows, large windows. And then let's say that we do actually standard about 10 liter per second per person, 0.5 for respiratory flow and 10, that's 20 times. I call them good ventilation, maybe two stop, out the air five stop. But if it is below 10 liter per second, maybe eight liter per second, see that between 0.5 to eight, I call it poor ventilation. So if it is very, very poor, then you may have a situation that your average concentration in the room is as bad as close to other's breath. Of course, you have a, the fourth situation, very, very bad, awful. And then your ventilation rate is less than your expiratory flow rate. This is worse than other's breath, and eventually you cannot live in that room. So we consider this fourth situation. I like to go to one at a time. Let's consider good ventilation. Very difficult to consider. And I do not have evidence, but I like to have two speculative situations. One is the well-known Diamond Princess outbreak in Tokyo, the cruise ship. On this ship, the Japanese government implemented quarantine on the 5th of February, 2020 among more, more than 300 sympathetic, sympathetic patients, they released about 200 of them with symptoms, the days of symptoms. With that information, I can calculate using some algorithm to find out when those people were infected. So divided people, those people into two groups, one of them is infected, stay in a room without infected cases, which means they were the only first one infected in the room. And you calculate them by the blue curve. You find them, they all were all infected before the 5th February. This is interesting. After 5th of February, nobody got infected if they had nobody in their room got infected. My speculation is that there was no spread between the state guest rooms after the quarantine dates. And this means the room central air conditioning probably did not play a role. Why this happened? Perhaps the rooms have a sufficient good ventilation. If the room is designed by eight or 10 liter per second per person, as according to standard, that's probably good. They may design a better ventilation rate. Unfortunately, there's no field data uh, available so far. I'd like to give you a second example, which is the World Dream cruise ship. And this is a ship owned in Hong Kong, and they had a small outbreak, not well known, and about 20 people infected. So here on this graph on the right, you can see different decks of the ship. And then you have the red dots, and those were the families. This is mainly Chinese were on this ship. And they were normally in a fam with a family as a unit. You can find those red dots are located at uh, randomly on different decks. I mean, you know, this ship is huge. And we, with our industry, you know, every deck, you would have many, many air handling units, HUs but there is no such a thing. One HU, so you have a, a spatial cluster of infections. This also means on this shape, it look like people, uh, sufficient ventilation in the state room probably also worked and there was no infection. So this is only two examples. There are many examples where there are no infection, but you and I would not know. And so let's see the five-star situation, outdoor air conditions. We identified 318 outbreaks in non-Hubei non provinces where there were more than three cases in the outbreak. And this was among 7,000 cases, something about 70% of the number of cases, about 11,000 cases in non-Hubei provinces. And there was only one case we find is infected outdoor 
in a village. All other cases, all other outbreaks occurred at, in homes and transport, restaurants, and so forth. So what does this mean? At least, but it's very difficult to tell, but at that time, China was in, uh, many cities were in lockdown conditions. So there were not many people outside. But in any case, the nearly a lack of infection outdoors, suggesting outdoor air may be pretty good. So these are the two situations, the five-star outdoor, outdoor air conditions, maybe the two-star good ventilation. So when you look at those venues where the outbreak were reported in mainland China and in Hong Kong, South Korea, and Singapore, this is incomplete list, you find them in some strange environment that you and I normally do not consider high-end offices, shopping centers. They are in barber shops, chess room, tea house, restaurant, and so shuttle bus, noodle house, and migrant dormitories. I really suspect those are the places that might be ventilation not so good. The outdoor idea of the air is not new. And this was in New York when the sanatorium was invented. So um, the question is, what happens if the ventilation is poor? We do not know. But I like to report two outbreaks where the ventilation rate were measured by us. And we find ventilation rate less than three liters per second per person led to infection. The first one was Guangzhou restaurant outbreak. And this family of 10 with one index patient and a few four other infected in the family, and they were set in a restaurant and the table A, and there are two tables, and this family came from Wuhan for a visit in Guangzhou. And then there are two families were on uh, their neighboring tables. And this would happen for lunch on the Chinese New Year Eve. And five people in those two families, B and C, got infected. All other families were safe. And the wait no waiters got infected. In this one, we measured, we find the ventilation rate was very low, about one liter per second per person. And the further distance between the furthest infected was about 4.6 meter. This is further than two meters, uh, uh, as we normally talk about. It's very difficult to tell somebody saying this is still short range, but I consider it as a long range. And you can see we made some measurement uh, in middle March, late middle March. There were, we had a surveillance videos for the full duration of the lunch, we find no close contact in the lift or in the room or elsewhere. There were five air conditioning units in this restaurant, a third floor. This is one, and you can see from the left figure, you find four air conditioning units on the right-hand side of the wall. And then you have a fifth one near coming to your side, you can see a blue door. And this, each of them, using computation for dynamics, you can find out how the streamlines colored by their concentration and recirculates in the room. And you can find for the table, three tables, A, B, and C, there is a recirculation. And if I look down from the top, then you can see the four air conditioners on the right hand side of the wall, now the bottom, produce airflow at the ceiling level, returned at floor level. And for tables A, B, C, you have seen the red streamlines. They actually introduce an interesting flow, and this is the state, state, steady state. In reality, it may not be. They formulate what I call recirculation bubble and put the tables A, B, C in blue to the right hand side, they create a little bubble there. And it's happened, they, there is no 
outdoor air flow from those air conditioning units. The only outdoor air flow is coming from probably mostly from the blue door, the fire door. People open, there is a gap. People open and close, open and close during the meal serving period. And these little bubbles had difficulties to have access to the outdoor air. I hope you can see the power. Uh, this slide on the left, it shows how the concentration of infectious aerosols change at a different table. And for table A, the left after some 4,000 seconds, and then the concentration decays at different rate. And different tables had different overlap period with family A, and even after family A left, and then there are still viable aerosols in the room, in the restaurant. It took us two months to realize you have to consider the filtration, the deactivation of the viruses in the aerosols before you can get the right-hand side exposure level. And the low exposure level for the higher, the three bars is table A, B, C. And then the further right, you have table 17, 18. Table 17, 18 had a relatively lower. They are the second largest, but they were not infected. All other tables had a lower exposure. So this is uh, uh, one of the outbreaks. I like to go to the second outbreak. This is the Hunan bus outbreaks. A young man went home on the 22nd of January. The Chinese New Year is 24th. And he went home for his family for the Chinese New Year. But he took the big bus on the right from Changsha to a small town in Hunan. And the bus runs for 3 hours 20 minutes. You can see from there how the bus runs from slow speed and high speed, higher speed on the highway. And then for 10 minutes uh, to run from the big bus station to the mini bus station, he took another bus for one hour to his village. Both buses he infected quite a few people, which are shown in the light red. So on the big bus, you can see that he infected the first row people. Okay, on the light bus, also seat number one B. So this is interesting outbreak. We find the original bus and the drivers, and we start to measure them and Professor Hang Jian measured them for 10 days. We even, because we, do not, we did not understand the bus ventilation well, we took the bus to the mechanics workshop. So they opened the bus, uh, the roof, and see how the air conditioning works. Of course, we need to model people in the bus. It was done during the lockdown period, and we could not find many people as a subject to test. So they have to use some kind of empty cylinder filled with boiling water to model the body plumes. We normally do two tests. One is we do we measure ventilation rate by tracer decay. We also release the tracer from index patient location and see how they spread in the bus or in the restaurant. For this big bus one and two, you have um, the statistic here. So attack rate for the big bus is 15.2%, for the mini bus, 12%. And it's happened for big bus the ventilation rate is about probably 1.7 liter per second per person, time integrated, averaged. And for mini bus two is probably 3.2. That's where the three comes from. And the exposure time was longer on big bus one also. Very interesting. If this is variable and then a larger ventilation rate corresponding to a lower um, attack rate. It's interesting to find out how the front row shown in red here and the non-infected show in green. So the front guy, front seat guy also got infected. And this is interesting for this bus, 
the air, the supply, actually due to uh, uh, the wind dynamics, you can find out later, I, did not, I don't show here, from the back uh, inflow, the, uh, the middle figure, the supply air is cold, and because that time is about 11 degree outside, the air flows around the floor and going to the front, and there is a toilet in the bus, uh, and that flow right bottom figure, you can see the flow uh, uh, diverted to the driver's side of the bus. And then you overall, the driver's side of the bus had more infections. For the small bus, it's also interesting that the flow comes in from the open windows near the index patient in red, and then it rises and they spread to the front. Believe it or not, we also surprised with computational fluid dynamic simulation. And then the front row guy was infected. Learning from these two outbreaks, and also the Diamond Princess Dream World cruise ship outbreaks, we probably can come to a preliminary recommendation. So ventilation rate lower than three liters per second, per second leads to long range aerosol trans infection, but the greater may be okay, speculative. We need further work, but we do not know what happens between C3, possibly eight. I must say this is only for long range airborne transmission, had nothing to do with short range airborne, which is totally different story. Probably we can see that SARS-CoV-2 is normally non-long non range airborne, particularly when there is a reasonably sufficient ventilation, but becomes airborne when there is insufficient ventilation. Using Professor Don Milton's terminology, I would refer this to as opportunistic airborne transmission. And insufficient ventilation becomes one of those unfavorable, uh, sorry, favorable environment when the opportunistic airborne transmission occurs. So he call uh, those that long range airborne diseases at normal conditions are called oblate airborne or preferential airborne. So ours probably opportunistic airborne. The opportunistic airborne is not a new story. And so many of us will know this Alaska airplane outbreak where 72% of 54 passengers became ill when they stay there grounded for three hours due to engine failure when outdoor is very cold, about one degree, one, two degree C. And Don, Professor Don Milton estimated that probably the ventilation rate is only about maximum 0.8 liter per cent per person. There was a lot of debate about this outbreak. Many people do not believe this is airborne. I suspect that influenza virus might be have similarly as SARS-CoV-2 in this situation. When you look at wells riley equation, you find out that the uh, denominator, you have ventilation rate, which is not air change rate. So it is the ventilation rate, not the air change rate that matters. And you can compare the big bus one, mini bus two, and the restaurant. And, and then the attack rate is something to do with with ventilation rate. A lower ventilation rate corresponding to a reasonable uh, high uh, uh, attack rate, but in the restaurants, a little bit difficult to tell because we have this bubble. If you consider within the bubble, attack rate is very high. Anyway, it's not the air change rate that matters, but the ventilation rate. And this comes to Many of us will consider air cabin ventilation, where you can find out air change rate can be 10, 12 air change power, you have half a filter, 
but this does not mean um, the airplane is safe. And some people claim this safe. And if you read consider ventilation rate, all engineers among our audience will know that FAA specify about 3.5 3 liter per second, plus 50% recirculation, you add up 7, 8 liter per second per person. And according to Professor Yan Chen, the uh, manufacturer may use higher value. So to me, the airplanes is just like an office in terms of long range airborne. But you know that risk of close contact might be greater because high people density. So airplane, you cannot claim because 10, 20, 12 air change power is safe. You really cannot claim that. It's time for me to comment on the ventilation rate. And those considerations are very preliminary. I hope that uh, uh, you will not mind for me to say something really critical. So ventilation rate changes over time with ASHRAE. I always believe, you know, the old data from Yagolo's time and Billings time are reasonable. You know why? Because that time we had the best tracer. That's our smell, the order, body order. People do not have today's hygiene, don't have time to take shower every day or cleaning. So they had the best tracer for their study. As we clean ourselves, hygiene condition improve, we do those studies becomes very, very difficult. And it's uh, interesting to see how the ventilation rate changes over time. I'd like to make a reference to the today's standard in ASHRAE. I already mentioned some ventilation rate lower than three liters per second. It can be a troublesome, but if you look at the ventilation rate requirement, minimum ventilation rate in ASHRAE standard, you'll find some spaces like uh, main, what is called this? I cannot read it. Uh, some lobbies and reception areas, the ventilation rate requirements is close to 3, 3.5 liter per second per person. It's interesting why the flow rate is low in those environment. I understand that uh, actually standard is not designed for infection control, but I also think why not? I learned the ventilation rate has two parts, the people source, the room source. It's interesting learning from the background. You find out that with this argument, some of the crowded environment, like it's religious workshop and auditorium, the very crowded ventilation rate much is lower than three liters per second, 2.7, 2.8. If you believe the stories are my preliminary results, then you would consider this as a risk area. Why they are low? And the reason is very simple because you have two components. One component is people, 2.5 or 5 liter, 2.5 liter per second per person. And plus the building areas. If you are crowded in crowded environment, then you have less building area. Hence, you have less pollutants, less, you, then you have less ventilation requirement. I suspect that why the 2.5 is constant, even in crowded environment is still constant. Why 2.5 is the rule of the game? Oh, this is because my limited understanding, some studies, the well-known study as mentioned before, Yaglo. Professor Yaglo's study shows that the air space per person occupied uh, about six, 100 or 700 cubic feet is the threshold above which the flow rate is relatively constant, maybe 2.5. I, I read SI units, I put liter per second per person here on the right hand side, vertical axis. So what is 600, 600 or 700 cubic feet per person? I consider, I assume the room height is three meters. Then I calculate the airspace square meter per person 
and square root, I find out distance between people. And then you find out amazingly, this six or seven hundred corresponding to two meter average distance between people. So it shows that as you're getting closer to each other, then you have uh, people who need a higher flow rate. To me, this is understandable because this is close contact. You are inhaling other people's breath directly. Very interesting. People, a few studies find out, oh, this may be true, may not be true. Why everyone, even Professor Yagro, questioned himself? So probably we need different. Why we should, every one of us, for people's thoughts, we should have a constant um, ventilation requirement. And this was done by Dr. Bill Kings and Professor Ole Funger. You know what they did? They have a visitor concept. They don't use the people inside the room anymore. They still do different concentrations and they let a visitor to inhale the air in the room. Totally different. The visitor will not experience the close contact situation. And then they find out every one of us need a ventilation rate constant, even in close contact. And that changes the situation. That's my reading. I think this is very important. There is a difference between visitor and the participants, the occupants. So this may be the case. I hope perhaps we need to visit this again. Second issue with Ashley standard, possibly, that assume the occupants pollutants by our effluent, your order is proportional to your respiratory flow rate. And they have different name for it. Inhalation flow rate, respiratory flow rate, breath, breathing rate, pulmonary ventilation rate in the uh, whatever. I just call it expiratory flow rate. When you have hard work, then you increase your flow rate. And that also means your ventilation rate will also need to be increased accordingly. Uh, based on my quick calculation here, you can read later, you need four times. And this was not reflected in Ashley standard as well. So there may be something we need to look at it. I consider that the expiratory breath, the, uh, the actual uh, uh, breath uh, smell may be a good indicator. And we need to think about this, how this happened. I think if you have uh, in real situation, you might be use CO2 sensor. There's a lot of debate. In reality, you can find out if you use 0.5 liter per second for uh, your respiratory flow and the ventilation is 8 liter per second, then you can find out that uh, the, due to every individual uh, uh, exhalation uh, CO2, then you can find the increase uh, of 500 and outdoor 400 and up to 900. So this is probably a good, good uh, uh, indication for reasonable ventilation in practical situation. Many of us know. However, in other literature, people define rebreath fraction, which is the fraction of in the air that is exhaled breath. And another definition by a Chinese researcher, Professor Jiang, and that's simply called breath dilution ratio, which is reciprocal of the rebreath fraction. And it might be too difficult for you to understand the concept in quickly, but I'd like to mention our 10 liter per second per person requirement is equivalent to a breath dilution ratio of 100 times or rebreath fraction 0.01. It's the same thing. So it is about how much we dilute our exhaled air, air in our room. And this would allow us to compare room dilution to that close to our breath. That is comparing long range and short range airborne. My next type uh, topic. I like to uh, mention my definition of airborne 
root and large droplets. My understanding, not definition. So airborne transmission is all about what carries the virus. What carries virus droplets, of course. But what carries droplets? So for airborne transmission, it looks like air carries. It's not air. Air cannot transport anything by itself. It is airflow. When there is no airflow, air cannot do anything. The, the particle will stay where it is, except the diffusion. So the accurate term for that may be airflow transmission. For droplets, the large droplets is the momentum. So the, the droplets gain their momentum at the point of release, and they have uh, they follow their momentum, and you have a ballistic trajectory. And that's the difference. So with this little definition, you can find out the so-called threshold droplet sizes. In the literature, people said, oh, it's 5, 10 micron. Only less than 5 to 10 is airborne. Above that is large droplets. But then you have this large droplet transmission. Actually, the deposition of droplets on your eyes, your nose, and your mouth uh, uh, um, membrane it, the probability is very low. It's a function of something called Stokes number. Anything less than 0.1, no deposition. Only happen when 0.1, larger than 0.1, this number. So you find out threshold size is between around 75 micron for a simple understanding. And my student published, just happened to publish this paper uh, during the pandemic. She did the work last two years, and she find out if you, from mechanism point of view, if you assume the virus concentration is the same in all size of viruses, which is not, by the way, then the short bound, short range airborne route is more important than so-called large droplet transmission. I mean, short range airborne, including 20, 30 micron that you inhale. All right. So this, let me think. How important is large droplet transmission? Why do we wear a mask, for instance? So I like to mention this little concept called extended short-range airborne, which I developed this concept during this pandemic. It basically, when the ventilation is poor, then the room average concentration, which might be a rising curve, uh, as depending on the time, you can you can have time dependent calculation, and then you have the concentration in the breath. So in short range, and extended short range airborne means when the ventilation is poor, that uh, then the room average concentration is just as bad as close within the close range of your breath. So we say that if the ventilation is only about one liter per second per person, then perhaps that at one meter from your mouth, then your exhale breath, you know, that condition is the same as everywhere in the room. So basically, you have no dilution in the room. So a normally non long range airborne becomes airborne. That's basically tell you what it is. Because time I will run very fast. So very important to us that this extended short range airborne can also occur when other conditions are met. For instance, you have a tube connecting two people. One people exhale, no dilution as the air goes from one mouth to another mouth, or in a stable air layer. For people with a little bit, with some fluid mechanics background, you know what had happened. But this happens in our displaced ventilation. And my supervisor, Professor Peter Nielsen, and Professor Mark Sandberg, we wrote in Ashley Journal, we do not recommend the use of displaced ventilation in hospitals in either single patient or multi patient wards for control of infection. So, ventilation is important to airborne transmission of COVID 19 in at least two aspects, as discussed so far. One, uh, insufficient ventilation leads to a probably non-airborne transmission of SARS-2 to long-range airborne. So poor ventilation leads to opportunistic airborne preliminary results. 
Number two, unfortunately, this is more difficult. So air flow patterns also were uh, important. The recirculation bubble or the mixing in non-perfect mixing in the bus actually may enhance airborne transmission with unfavorable release or infection aerosols. By the way, when you have this opportunity airborne, it's not difficult to control. We engineers can simply give better ventilation or better engineering design if we understand the air distribution better. My point is, it is easy to control the long range airborne portion of COVID-19, although it's not very big, close uh, transmission may dominate, okay? And these are the roles of HVAC engineer. Who are they? Our members. So going back to this airborne inconsistency I mentioned earlier in the talk, probably originated from our collective fear of the airborne transmission. But actually, if you recognize two different types of airborne transmission, then you will not be fear. You will not fear the second category. So the first category can occur at normal indoor air conditions. Might be, sorry, I need to uh, look at uh, some, there are some uh, questions, answers I somehow I, read the technical support, so I did not read the questions. I will answer these questions uh, as, as time when I finish the talk. So then those are easy controlled by the ventilation, only occur in crowded, pretty ventilated areas. So that's what you and I can probably help. Now, I have these complex diagrams, and here is the, on the horizontal distance, you have a within two meters, short range airborne, 1.5 meter, and then beyond that you have long range, and then you further beyond you have very long range. So <clears throat> at the normal conditions, ventilation conditions, at some distance away from you, uh, from uh, the mouth, then you basically have room average conditions, okay? If you improve, have more greater ventilation and the concentration much lower. The risk of infection also lower. If you further down, very, very high flow rate, you get out of air. That's five star conditions. But if you are having less than eight liter per second per person, you have poor ventilation. If you above your threshold, 0.5 liter per second per person, you have awful condition. Okay. So it depends on the diseases. For tuberculosis, measles, chickenpox, you may have infection normal conditions. But for SARS-1, I guess MERS, SARS-1, and influenza MERS cause uh, SARS-2, then you probably have long-range airborne in poor ventilation, but you probably have short-range conditions. So my point is normally a non-airborne infection turn into long-range airborne if ventilation is not so good. I really cannot make a conclusion. I really cannot make a conclusion, but preliminary remarks, because the work is still ongoing. So basically, ventilation rate less than three liters per second per person resulted in SARS-2 infection in two outbreaks, indicating that perhaps we should avoid them. I believe for people to open, reopen business in some crowded environment or some environment where ventilation is not so good, we really need to measure the ventilation rate. If you have sufficient ventilation, may work, and this will need further work. And there's also a need for us to examine the ventilation requirement standard. Perhaps asking the question, why not taking minimizing ventilation infection into consideration following this painful experience? Perhaps after in the during post pandemic period, we will reflect deeply about how we design our indoor environment, how we can use the latest technology for the transmission route. As I mentioned very early on, perhaps reconsider the harmony between privacy and public good. We need those data 
for uh, uh, investigating possible uh, um, transmission route. Thank you very much. I can start to answer questions, but let me drink a little bit of water first. Um, let me go from one question from Nathan uh, Fix. So you ask, did the HVAC systems have any secondary disinfection devices such as UV or bipolar? In all the outbreaks I analyzed, there was no such uh, disinfection devices. And the bus actually had nothing. It's an old bus. And um, the bus manufacturer already closed their business. And the ventilation system was nearly malfunctional. It's mainly driven by the wind flows. So when you drive faster, you have a larger flow rate. That's why we had a little bit difficult time to measure and do the simulation because we have to consider all conditions. The minibus variant, uh, the bus driver can could open the windows. But now I like to know how I can read all, all questions. Oh, from David Goldstein, what kind of filter did the recirculation AC unit in the restaurant have? Very simple one, the metal filter. And we, it was only uh, came to our attention uh, a few weeks ago when we realized our problem because uh, we submit our preprint first and we find, uh, and then we need to answer a few more questions. And then we find out it's very, very important to consider this first by simulation. Then we went back to the restaurant and did the measurement. So for PM 2.5, TM 10, and the filtration efficiency probably between 20 to 40 uh, uh, percent after the measurement. And, and this was already studied in the literature. From uh, uh, Liu Xiaobing, how the normalized concentration is defined very simple, uh, divided by one of the largest value. It's only for comparison purposes because we do not know what are the um, and the dose of infection. And there were two uh, kind of concentration. First, it was during the measurement because we release uh, the tracer, which is ethan, uh, from the possible infectious uh, index patient, a source patient, and then we measure concentration at different locations using Innova machine. Um, you know, the latest model, you have 20 samplers, sampling points. And then we, you don't use the index patient location as source uh, because that's very, very high. You use their neighboring uh, seats or in the restaurants, also a uh, neighboring table. And as long as you use one concentration as your, uh, for normalization, it can be comparable. From Miss Lisa Ng. What is the, the question is, what's the assumed ratio of infectious particles compared with released particles in the restaurant case? Oh, this is an interesting question. I don't know how to, we did not assume any ratio. And if you asked about uh, how do we consider what particles are infectious, what particles are not infectious. We, in the ca we cannot do that in the measurement, of course, we release a uh, tracer gas. In the simulation, we release five or 10 micron particles. And then because it evaporates very, very fast. And, and then we consider the activ activation uh, rate as measured in the literature. There's only one study that you can use. And then we simply calculate, I mean, we discussed earlier on with a normalized concentration, and that's the only thing we can compare. And in theory, we can calculate the quanta, but uh, for the restaurant case, it's, uh, it's possible. Uh, one of my former students had a, a algorithm to do the calculation. By this moment, we have not focused on the calculation yet. I think for the bus, 
and the quanta probably about 40 to 60 uh, quanta per hour. From pole, would the vertical airflow with sufficient velocity remove short-range virus particle? This is an amazing question, Paul. Um, I actually do not know. Um, it's all interaction between uh, the vertical flow and the, your plume, and it depending how fast you, if you talk, as I talk now, my expired flow velocity may be greater, say two meter per second per person, or even greater at the peak, but there is a cycle that will instant my flow rate, uh, my velocity is lower, say than 0.2 meter per second, than my body plume 0.2, but if you have a flow vertical, vertically going up, then, sorry, Oh, because I have this speaker, so I will make sure it works. And then you may actually control the flow. Um, uh, some flows so that the axial flow followed upward flow instead of going forward. But the, if your vertical flow rate is less than, say, one meter per second, that's very difficult. You cannot get one meter per second. Interestingly, if you look at uh, Dr. Bill King's ventilation rate study, and he used a uh, flow supply. And I just only recently read it. I think uh, the short range airborne particle, very difficult to use ventilation to control. And perhaps personal, personalized ventilation may be a better uh, mechanism. And there's a lot of studies. Uh, you can look at a number of experts in our field. So, same question from Paul. Must airflow be downward or must be better for it to be upward? <laughs> um, difficult. I have had a long discussion for many years with Professor Peter Madison, uh, Peter Nielsen and Professor Mas Sandber about the best airflow rate. I think if you ask Peter, we all agree perhaps mixing is better. We try to create a mixing. And this upward flow, in particular with displacement, is, can only occur with a condition. But you can, no one for a office, a typical indoor environment to have the clean room design. So it's not about downward and upwards. But uh, if you have a large air change rate, like in airborne isolation rooms, we use downward with uh, also upward flow at another section of the room. So it's top supply, top return. And, but in generic answer, very difficult. You might have a better. It's interesting if you can answer the question in, in, in Q, uh, question and answers. New one, pan. The question rate, ventilation rate, not air change rate. ACH matters. This is contradicting with actually technical position. CDC recommendations? I don't know. I think the uh, nobody claim, I think even in CDC recommendation for airborne negative pressure isolation rooms, they use six or 12 air change power in actually does the same. But this does not mean that air change power matters. I think it's for convenience. I look at that. I many years ago I helped WHO wrote a guideline for cause of natural ventilation. I look into this issue better. I try to explain the suitability of air change power for considering transient situation and for uh, you know um, decay or or, 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 or or rise situation, but perhaps. But even in that, for the natural ventilation, we start to use later per second. There has been uh, uh, quite a few, uh, dis have been a, a few discussions during this period. Um, many people probably prefer ventilation rate. And um, anyway, actually standard 62.1 also use uh, ventilation rate, later per second per person rather than ACH. <laughs> 
Christopher Larson, uh, Mr. Christopher Larson. A uh, little bit of long question. For the bus and the restaurant, you cannot control what the people experienced before they entered, how they behaved in the space. How can you see the space airflow pattern cause these patterns unless you know that? It could be the CFD is being used to explain a premise. Could it be that people who were infected but not directly near the subject were infected elsewhere? Great question. And this is, as you know, we for study like this, I always we always work with epidemiologists, and there is a significant epidemiological studies. And those outbreaks, we true study, all occurred outside the Hubei province. In those provinces, every city at the time had less than a few hundred, maximum 1,000 during the entire uh, pandemic uh, infected cases. So the National Health Commission or local CDCs had enough time to do the contact tracing. It's amazing how much contact tracing they have done. So to know they came from the same source. As regarding to uh, whether they were infected elsewhere, there were not so many infected people in the city. For both outbreaks, it, there were less than some hundred cases or even 50 confirmed cases in the entire city of seven or 10 million people. The probability of them infected elsewhere, very low. However, there was a possibility they were infected in the bus station. So we did a detailed uh, study how when they were, uh, when this guy was in the station in Changsha uh, 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 bus station, actually brand new station, very big and very spacious. So the probability for them to meet there uh, in this kind of environment, very low. There are hundreds other buses. None of them had the infection, only this bus. Also, for these two buses, there were videos, surveillance videos available, but somehow the bus driver erased it after the CDC investigated. We actually, uh, fortunately, they kept something between 15 and 20 photos and a few uh, uh, 10, 20 seconds uh, videos available. So we were able to find out what happened on the bus. And we also called some of the passengers we were able to access to, to find them. And this, as I mentioned, this is a good question, but this is part of study to rule out possibility of other uh, infection. But it's still possible. I mean, always possible. But for the bus, it's interesting. This guy jumped from one bus to another. And during that period in the entire Hunan province, only two buses had this infection. And this, if coincidence, then very difficult to, 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 to justify. And because of the service videos, you were able, I mean, the, the, the index patient was a modest young man, educated. He did not try to jump the queue. He was the first one, one of the first jump to the bus, one of the last get off. He did not uh, interact with many other people. From Ms. Julie Fair, can you recommend the effect of relative humidity on transmission of virus such as COVID-19? I'm not an expert. A lot of people studied. I think Ashley has a book on humidity. There's a lot of uh, discussions, and we have uh, uh, a number of experts in the US. And I probably better not to answer this question and because I have not studied it and for COVID-19. Sorry. Uh, how do I pronounce? Can carry? Keisha? Just ventilation is enough. The question is, what about the airflow pattern in the space ventilation effectiveness? Of course, you are right. I think uh, uh, the restaurant is an uh, is example. Um, that airflow pattern in that restaurant play a very decisive role for uh, the occurrence of infection within that bubble and perhaps non-occurrence, a lack of, of infection beyond that bubble. And people ask me, what happened if you 
that whole thing mixed, would that be uh, reduced infection? We have not done study. And, and, uh, but anyway, answer your questions, ventilation effectiveness is important. I believe I have answered all the questions.